everything is well configured. Okay, perfect. So I am Jordi Montes. I studied at the Barcelona uh, um, UBC, that it's the university, the like Polytechnic University in, in Barcelona, where Hacks UPC was born. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, something that as a student you may be like really uh, worried about, that it's what happens when you are done with uh, university. Uh, I am not that old, I am only 28 years old, so this experience, you know, it's not that far from when I graduated, so most of the things that I lived keep uh, applying, so it's not like listening someone from, you know, I don't know, 50 something years old explaining you how you, after university you get your first job when everything has already changed. So, um, the idea is to uh, basically uh, give you a framework about what you should ex expect after you are done with university and then have a questions and answer um, period where you basically can ask me anything you are worried about and I will try to uh, resolve all your, all your doubts. So, first of all, uh, there are many people that don't even go to university, there are many other people who go to university discover what university is, how much they hate it, and they just like, leave, like drop out. Then there are people who finish university because they get their degree, and they are pretty happy about it, because they had a good time there, so you know they may think about spending even more time there, even if it sounds crazy, uh, through a master's degree or a PhD. And then there are other people who graduate and say, okay, up to here, this is the last time in my life that I'm going to step at uh, like this floor, like at university, they, they really hate it. So in this talk, we talk for all of them. Um, if you have gone to university, even if you dropped out, there are some topics that uh, should be familiar to you. Um, first of all, algorithms and data structures. Uh, this is something that if you are going to work as a software developer, you should really care about and you have to First of all, have the notions about what algorithms and data structures are like mostly used. You should also be able to uh, pick up new algorithms and data structures pretty fast. And uh, of course, you should be able to compare them. And for that, you need a lot of knowledge about how the machine works, uh, um, with what kind of data you are going to put in, in, in that data structure algorithm. So, you know, the time that you spend at university is good. If you dropped out, it's okay, but you should spend time on, on this. There are always like, at the end I'm going to give you like many um, uh, mediums that you can learn from, like some YouTube channels or uh, books, etc., meetups, and you should really take care of this. Then something that you should also be uh, pretty much um, familiar with, it's uh, programming languages and not only one, uh, you should be fluent in one, two, or three programming languages when you are done. Fluent means that I can give you a task and you are able to do it, a simple task, okay? I understand that at university, most of the tasks that you have to perform are simple in the way that they don't involve too much infrastructure. You only need to write your code. The smartest part that you do at university is the algorithm, but you should be able to um, code in different languages, plus know the differences between them, when to use one and when to use another one. Um, depending on which career path you, you take, the language that you choose, uh, it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, why? Because if it's uh, something widely used, like, I don't know, web servers, um, you will end up in one community or another, depending on which language you are using, because you are going to be constrained in which which uh, tools there are available. So it's really important which language you do, because even if you are able to do everything with the same, uh, with different languages, um, most of the things are going to be already resolved. So you will have like different libraries, different way to approach uh, the problems, different um, usage of the resources of the machine. So it can be uh, cheaper or more expensive for your employee and they really care about this. Then you should also, if you're thinking about working as a software developer, know about databases, relational and not, not NoSQL. So basically you should be able to uh, like 
giving some uh, tables, do a SQL query, that, that's really important. You should also be able to uh, analyze why the database is not performing um, properly. You know, maybe you have to re-index. This is something that as a software developer you're going to find uh, like many, many times. And also NoSQL solutions because uh, even for prototyping, NoSQL many times it's, it's better because you don't have you, you don't know you don't have the knowledge of what you have to build. You you don't know it yet. So some less restrictive uh, models like I don't know the one of Mo MongoDB with a um, document uh, database. It, it's a really good fit there. So you should at least know that they exist and be able to look for them on the internet and be able to deploy it and interact with it. Um, also, after spending some time at university, you should know how machine, like where your code is it's, it's running on top of. So um, even if what you like the most, it's high level languages like Haskell that allows you to express your ideas and your code in a really beautiful way. You need to know where that code is running. And I am really sorry, it runs on machines that are binary machines. They work on, on transistors, then how they have SSDs and hard drives for um, long-term um, uh, storage, then how you are constrained by RAM, that it's a random access memory, and how that RAM gets like gets the data to the, the CPU, how the CPU instructions work. This is, uh, seems really silly, but at the end, um, what you're going to do as an, an engineer is you're going to run some programs and they're going to fail because that's always what it happens. Or uh, at first are going to work and then you're going to push the limits to it. Like maybe you want to uh, handle more data or uh, you want to uh, use like less resources and uh, you're going to have a problem there and you are going to have to uh, profile. And for that, the only way to know what's going to work it's to know when you where you are running. If not, uh, you are you are pretty much lost. Then uh, operating systems. After spending some time at university, you are really expected to know. <laughs> like that machine that I said, it's a binary machine, but you don't uh, have access to the hardware itself. You have a layer in the middle that it's the operating system. Um, usually, as a software developer, you are going to work on Unix-like systems, uh, Mac OS or Linux. Uh, some people also work on Windows and uh, they have like their own tools and uh, their own, you know, um, frameworks for doing that. And like the libraries that Windows provides, etc. But it's really important that uh, you really know how things are, are going there. For example, uh, you want to deploy a web server, you need to know how the machine you're going to be running on, it's going to uh, connect through networking. So you really have to know how your operating system, uh, you can tweak the DNS or, or all these kinds of configurations because if not, you're going to be pretty much, much lost. And uh, because it's 2020, uh, you are also expected to know what cloud computing is and uh, the main architectures there because if not, well, you can learn it in the, in the first job, but it can open to you many, many doors. Because uh, until now you have mostly work on your computer and uh, you send some files and you give some explanations about how the other person has to run it. But most of the code that I work on, I don't like, sorry, most of the code that I use, like the applications that I use, I don't have to run the code for it. Like my mom, it's using, Facebook and she has no idea about how to run Facebook. And uh, because most of the companies don't have the scale as uh, Facebook, uh, you are not going to have your own machines like in a data center, you are going to have to um, rent it and you are going to end up renting it to Amazon Web Service, Digital Ocean or uh, Google Cloud Platform for name some of them. Uh, so you are expected to know, you know, what those platforms offer uh, how many pieces are there that are like crazy amount of pieces and how they fit uh, together. Now, um, 
if you are done with university and uh, you are basically um, having to choose what's next, at university it was really easy because the courses that you had to take next were like, first of all, really limited. Second of all, you had to take like, I don't know, three out of 10. So you, you have 10 options, you choose three and you cannot skip them. Okay. Um, but now that you are done with university or you just drop out, you have to really think, okay, I am, I don't know, 20 something. Uh, what do I want to do with my life or what things are, are like I am passionate about enough to be able to work on that, uh, eight hours per day, multiple days per week. Um, this is something that not that many people do. Like most of them lose, well, lose, spend many years working on things that, you know, they don't like, and they don't know that that's not a way to live until they change a job and randomly out of the blue, they are like, Oh my God, this is so much better. I wish I had this knowledge before. So I could have started here. And I would be already ahead on this new career path that I'm following. So um, let's say, and this applies to uh, both things. Eh? It's not only what you like, also what you are good at. Because if not, you, it's true, like you can get a junior uh, software position or a junior developer position in the many companies, even if you don't have the right knowledge for it, but you are going to be stuck there. Like you're not going to progress. And if you're not good at it, no, because even if you like something a lot, if, if you don't keep progressing, you are more or less screwed. So here you have to kind of try to find a balance. Now, uh, if what you like is programming, you already know like, okay, um, you don't have any problem about spending many hours programming. You don't have any problem about um, debugging that it's something that you are going to have to do a lot. Uh, you don't have any problem about um, communicating with other people, then programming is one of the, the, the branches that you can do. And for that, you will see that not all programmers do the same. Uh, nowadays, the biggest uh, industries are web development. So if uh, you are happy about doing some kind of product, like I don't know from for saying some names, sorry for this, like Skyscanner, like a flight um, company, you know, like something for looking for flights, an aggregator. Or if you want to do um, some app that, uh, I don't know, it's going to allow you to hire people for fixing your house. Uh, then web development, it, it's like the biggest thing. Uh, it also depends on the um, city that you live. Uh, here in Barcelona, for example, yeah, web development, it's what, the, like the biggest market is. Then there are also video games. Um, that's really cool for people who like it. And it's an industry that here in Barcelona also is, is pretty huge. But, you know, you're going to be programming for uh, video games. And then the kind of job that you're going to do, it's totally different from what web developers do. There are some overlapping, but trust me that it's, it's not the same. Then you can also say, okay, no, what I like is be informatics. Um, here I didn't say be informatics because it's a huge, like a really big um, field. Instead of that, it's here because uh, basically it's saying, okay, you have knowledge about how to program. Uh, you just go to another uh, field in this uh, in this case uh, biology, and then you do be informatics. You can do the same with almost everything because all the uh, other um, uh, how is it called? All the other uh, fields are basically looking for um, programmers because it's going to revolutionize everything and we are still there. So, you know, if what you like it's art, you can actually do art with informatics. So try to look uh, for a job on that. And also embedded systems that it's basically low level uh, stuff. I don't know, like chips for... Uh, washing machines or, you know, really restricted uh, devices. Now with IoT, you know, uh, everything is going to be connected to the internet. So there is this new thing called edge computing. So that kind of, of stuff. Um, if instead of programming, what you like a lot is uh, system configuration, uh, you will already know that because you will have to have a lot of scripts in your computer. If you are that kind of person who say, oh, no, 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 I really like to, you know, automatize things 
uh, Star Software, Connect Software. Uh, this is basically what Sys, as, uh, Sys administration does. And it's really cool. Now all the companies are asking for it because, okay, it's true that they don't have to deal with machines anymore. Like they don't operate having some uh, um, machine servers in the, in the office. But even so, someone has to take care of what I said before with the cloud of, you know, which services do we have to deploy there, how they have to interact and how much we are going to pay for it. This is basically what these admins take, take care of. And then there is another path that it's, let's say that you have been doing mathematics, I'm um, sorry, computer science uh, at the university or informatics. And after a while you notice like, okay, uh, I kind of like this programming thing. I like this sysadmin, but what I enjoy the most is the mathematical part. Um, that can be like high performance computing, uh, you know, like running things for supercomputers. Or it can also be like, no, no, what I like, it's uh, theoretical computer science with, um, <clears throat> with um, how is it called? Like, um, I don't know, for example, complexity theory or cryptography, all these kinds of things that are really like theoretical, even if they are um, applied mathematics. Uh, and then depending on what you like, you should choose one or another. If what you really like is mathematics, you should also focus more on an academia or research stuff in uh, some kind of companies than if you like programming. Now, um, if you are already done and uh, you already know what kind of industry you want to work in and uh, what kind of challenges you want to be solving every day, um, you're going to look for the companies that are potentially um, employees for you, like the people who are going to employ you. Um, for that, you can use LinkedIn. Uh, if, if in LinkedIn you just put that you are a software developer, you are going to have recruiters calling you every day. Um, so it, it's really easy nowadays. Uh, but it's really important that you don't uh, reply to random recruiters and just expect it to, to happen. What you have to do is an analysis of what kind of, of companies you want to work on in, sorry, then look in the area that you want to um, work for those companies that um, have those properties, check what kind of company of companies they are, if they are a new or old uh, style company, and then ap apply for it and prepare as much as you can. Here, how it works is all the companies now are converging more or less in uh, some kind of interview process for all of them, because all of them are product companies. So they have a product, a web service, and you know, they want it to, they need developers for, for working on it. It's a bit long, but it, it pays off because those companies are going to give you many perks. Um, I am talking about big companies like Google or Facebook and also small companies or small startups that got like a lot of investment, like travel perk. Um, so it basically, it's first a recruiter calls you and ask you a few questions just to know if you are a potential match or not. Uh, those questions are not hard, are basically like, okay, explain me a bit about you. Uh, they want to see that, first of all, you are not a psycho, that you know how to communicate, um, and uh, that you know a bit of uh, computers, but just a bit. After that, because they don't want to lose too much time, they are going to send you a coding, ch a coding challenge that it's going to last, like have some um, amount of time for, uh, you have uh, some amount of time for um, solving it. And uh, basically what you're going to do is go to a link, then it's going to start the, the countdown. You're going to have one or two problems. Usually they are algorithmic problems. The difficulty changes um, depending on the, what kind of company you are applying to. Of course, don't expect the same. If it's Google, then if it's, uh, I don't know, a small startup that whoever can can, uh, can work there and because they, they are really wanted to hire someone because, you know, they need a developer for JavaScript tomorrow. Um, after that, if you pass this, this interview, this is just a filter because they don't want to lose time. After you pass the, the coding challenge, basically what you show them is that, okay, this is a potential candidate. Now we can spend time on, 
on him or her. Uh, so what is going to happen is they are going to call you. Well, they are going to uh, you're going to have an appointment with them, and it's going to be for a um, technical interview this time. Uh, it's going to be with an engineer, and uh, he's going to ask or she's going to ask you things about you know your knowledge. What what have you done before? Even if you don't have uh, any experience in the market, you can say you know what kind of um, problems you solve at the university, which motivations you have, what things you find challenging, what things you do, do you like to spend time on, and also some technical problems. Here you can expect um, not only uh, coding challenges like algorithmic uh, problems, but also questions more related with the technology itself. So if you're applying for a JavaScript position, there are many chances that they are going to ask you what a closure is or um, in the browser, which API allows you to do X or, you know, how would you store this information in the browser? So it, it's important to have knowledge about the, the tool that you're going to be using. If you pass that one, you're going to go to an on-site interview. This one can be longer. It depends how much time and resources the company has to spend. Big companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, it's basically almost an all day long um, interview with multiple interviewers, uh, multiple questions, and then every hour you keep switching and someone else gets into the room and starts asking you things. You have to design systems on a whiteboard, you have to do algorithmia, and uh, something that small and uh, big companies are caring about more and more and more lately is cultural fit. They don't want any more someone who is just technically brilliant, but you actually have to align with the values of the company and, um, you know, the kind of um, the environment that they are going to provide. They don't want you to be an outlier uh, there because you can break the flows that the company already has. And that's something that uh, it would be an, an expected event and companies don't like an expected event as you can see now with uh, coronaviruses and disruptions. After that, you, you are done. Basically, you are going to have an offer or a rejection. If you have an offer and it's something that you care about, congratulations. You can always negotiate. You can say, I have other offers if it's true or you know this is not what I expected. It's also good in that point to ask about the future. Nobody is going to like nobody is going to retire an offer. So if they give you a lower salary than you expected, you can say, okay, I can accept this now, but which is the career path, the evolution that I'm, I can I can have here to create some expectations and then be able to, to follow it inside. And if it's a rejection, something that is really good is when you ask for feedback, like, okay, so can you tell me why I didn't get it? But usually companies don't, don't give you uh, <laughs> good feedback. This is really bad, but usually it is one because you don't know the technology or you are not a good fit um, for that uh, tool set and they need someone that starts performing since the beginning. Uh, if not, it could be the cultural fit. Uh, I don't know. They saw something like you really like to, um, well, it, it depends on, on the company, so I, I don't want to say anything here. But, uh, you know, it may be that you are too ambitious and they are looking for something else or you are too, uh, you are not an out of the box thinker and they are looking for that kind of role right now. So it could be that. And uh, many times it's simply that you are competing against other people and for that position you have the bad luck that someone with more experience or that it's a better fit for multiple reasons applied at the same time and they had to go with him or her. Now, let's say that uh, you are hired in a company. Um, let's go to focus on product companies that I said that most of the companies now are product companies in, in most of the markets. So how it's going to, to, to work, okay, after you are, you are hired? Uh, because at first they are going to sell you like the company quite a lot. They are going to say things like, I don't know, if you really like planes and you want to work for Airbus, you're going to be hired for Airbus and you're like, okay, this is really cool, but I'm going to change the traveling industry, but how are going my, my days look, are going to look like? Um, 
all the companies nowadays are doing agile. Um, agile is a movement that started against what existed before, that was a uh, cascade, uh, waterfall, sorry, waterfall um, development, where some people said, okay, we have to build this product. And then they design all, all the steps for building this product. And then they give it to the developers and, uh, you know, they had deadlines and they always failed. Um, that's because um, that kind of um, waterfall um, approach worked really well before for technical stuff. Like if you are Volkswagen, you can design a new uh, piece and uh, you are going to have the machinery and the factories for doing that. So it's really good to uh, do this kind of uh, requirement analysis before, but for software, most of the time, we don't know how to do the analysis correctly. So it just doesn't work. So nowadays everyone is doing agile, that it's a movement that started from some people who was, was against of this kind of um, organization for um, software development. What's the problem? They say like, okay, waterfall does not work. We have this new thing that it's uh, non-process oriented. We are not going to define a process and uh, we are going to be really uh, output oriented, like uh, focused on the results and trying to learn from the product and iterate as much as we can and bring value to the company as often as we can and then keep iterating and you know, build products in, in this uh, iterative way. What happened? Most of the people said, okay, this is much better. We're going to do that. And they started copying it, but they noticed like, okay, I have 35 developers. How do I organize them? And then they say, okay, no process, but I'm going to create a process for this no process thing. And they started adding ton of, of, of bullshit that most of the people are following now, like religion, even if it's broken. And this means that when you joined to a, um, a software development team, usually what they are going to tell you is, okay, we are agile. What we do is uh, every week we start with a kickoff of which are the things that we have to solve for this week. We are going to create tickets with estimations of how hard every task is and uh, we are going to put those in, on, on Jira. We are going to assign it to each one of the developers. Then uh, they are going to have something like a Kanban process maybe that says, okay, to do, uh, doing and done, so they can follow the process of these tasks. And then every two weeks you will have retros where you meet your team and say which things went well, which things didn't work. Um, basically all the things that shouldn't be agile uh, have been now typified as, okay, this is agile, you have to follow it. So this is how companies are organized uh, nowadays. So when you see on a job offer, we are agile, they basically mean this, this kind of things. Uh, something that um, happens is that we don't know how to organize big teams of people. Um, you know, if you give me 100 developers, uh, I don't know how to give a task to 100 developers. What I can do is take the big task that I have to do, break it in small pieces, break it again into smaller pieces and give those smaller pieces to each one of the developers and then have another task that it's merging them together. And for that, something that is really good is to keep small, um, small teams that basically have the knowledge about what they are doing and they can focus on have, doing the end job of, you know, doing actually the, the small thing and then merging it together. Uh, even so, those are the developers, but someone has to direct, someone has to create those Jira tickets, no, that I said. Someone has to say, these are the tasks that we have to do. For that, uh, there are product managers or product owners that basically have in mind how the things have to evolve. And uh, for that reason, they are in the middle of the business part and technical part. And they are the ones who prioritize how things have to be done. They are the ones who decide which things are acceptable or not and for when it can be done. And those companies, um, to be sure that they don't keep track and they keep moving in the right direction, have OKRs that basically is object, I think it's something like object K, I don't know what, 
sorry, I don't remember, but it's um, three, like it goes per quarters and gives you some objectives or goals that you want to, to, to get uh, after these three months. They are not small tasks. Let, let's say something, you're a company and they say, uh, what we have, to, what we want is um, um, split by half the time that testing takes or, or our Amazon bill. Okay, so that's a goal. And then the teams try to organize themselves and perform tasks that approach to that OKRs. And then um, you are going to be working on those squads that it's these small teams of, of 10 people. But then you will have a manager that is going to give you ones to ones that it's basically a meeting every two weeks, something like that. So you can expose if you, your concerns about how the company is going, how the team is going, if uh, you have any personal problem with people in the team or if uh, you want to discuss some um, personal objectives uh, that you have and you want to grow in the company. Um, that was about how people organize. Now, what happens with the tooling that you are going to be using? Um, for sure, you are going to be using Git. It's really weird if you are using something else. Weird means uh, not a statistical uh, <laughs> representative uh, in this case. Because, uh, yeah, there are even big, big projects like, I don't know, LVM that's still being using Subversion, but nowadays everyone is it's using it. Uh, but you're going to have there some um, version system, control, version control system for your, for your code. You are going to be um, working on a huge, um, how is it called, uh, source tree with, you know, multiple directories and, and files that contain the logic for all the things that the company has that it's called a monolith or you're going to work in this kind of uh, new microservices uh, architecture where each um, subsystem or service has its own um, folder with stuff um, and all the the the, the the code it's living for that microservice it's living in that folder, and um, then it's it they say that it's easier, no? Um, that's actually a, a lie. <laughs> I know that this sounds strong, but it is, and it is because there is a misconception. Basically, um, there are big companies that have a monolith and they made it work. And I'm talking about companies like Google. They have. Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of uh, lines of code. Um, but what they have is modular code. Then people with microservices, this should be modularity, but they understand it like a deployment strategy where they say, okay, now I have these microservices that are their own repositories with their own uh, dependencies and uh, I'm going to deploy them uh, alone. And this is a misconception. Microservices, it's a, it's in the logical uh, layer. Even so, when you apply for a job and they say that they do microservices, they are going to be talking about the other thing. They have repositories for different services and they have to deploy it, um, each one. You are going to write your code and then open PRs. Uh, so other people check your code. It's uh, actually a healthy, a healthy way to do it. You shouldn't. Um, you should trust your um, colleagues a lot because uh, if you are working with people that you do not trust, you should move unless you have a stock or something in the company and you want to like the company to succeed for something, for some reason. But uh, if not, you should always trust them. But it's always better to do um, PRs so the knowledge is transferred. Some people do not do PRs because they say, okay, this is for this part of the system. I am the only one in the company that has the knowledge for this. So why would do a PR about this if, you know, my uh, colleague cannot check it because he doesn't have the knowledge. That doesn't make sense. So I'm going to merge it directly because I know that it works. Okay. I don't give a shit if it works or not. You have to do the PR because that's the problem, that you are the only one that has the knowledge of this. So your colleague has to stop and he's going to ask you, sorry, I don't understand this. You are going to explain it to him so he gathers the knowledge and even the day that you are sick, he's able to fix a problem there. 
Um, nowadays, uh, almost everyone that deploys in the cloud, they are doing uh, Docker and Kubernetes stuff that basically containerizes your, your applications with your dependencies and, you know, just ship it there. The, um, all the companies think that that's going to solve their problems that they are not. Uh, as a new grad, you want to work on the edge, um, with the edge kind of technology all the time. That's really good. You should do it. It's really good for your resume. resume. But um, it's, it's going to break. So the new thing now, it's going to break in the future. And something new is going to appear. And it will always happen. Because it's not about having good tools, but tools that perform correctly and there's some trade-off. So Kubernetes now has some trade-offs. Companies start migrating to it because they see the bad things that they have in their um, own infrastructure right now. They are going to migrate to Kubernetes, which may solve some of the problems that they have right now, but it's going to create some other ones. So someone else is going to come with another solution that it's going to have these trade-offs better and you're going to have to migrate again. So it's very important that you work on the less technology, but that you understand that everything is a trade-off and what kind of things are uh, the ones that you are looking for. And then there is monitoring and logging, that it's basically you have machines running some services. Some people are paying you for that service. So you have to know exactly how much people are using it. You have to know exactly which is your uh, capacity. You have to know um, when it's broken and where it's not. You have to know when bugs happen. And this is what monitoring and logging uh, takes care of. Uh, it's basically observability of, of your systems. And uh, it's something that the system developer is going to do for you. But it's important that you don't live in a box where you know you just like deploy your code and ship it. And you say, like, OK, it's, it's done. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> good luck for the sysadmin. No, you have to actually understand how things are monitored and you have to, to help. This is basically the DevOps uh, movement that started some years ago. Now, um, most of the tools that your company is going to be using, for sure, unless you are in a niche uh, kind of, uh, of uh, market, it's going to be open source. Uh, it's going to be open source and open knowledge. The good thing of this is that uh, the software that they are going to be using, you can see it. For example, um, you may not be able to use uh, Jira for your project because you have to pay for it. Uh, or use, for example, I don't know, Amazon because you have to put your credit card there. But there are alternatives for, for, for many software that um, you're going to be able to check even before joining the company, like Kubernetes. So you can play in, in, in your computer. It's really good because all this open source knowledge um, stuff keeps spinning and uh, keeps rolling. And it's uh, a really friendly uh, environment for learning because people who know it want to explain it. And uh, then there are many conferences, meetups, other friends that work for other companies, and they can tell you what they are doing because it's open. <clears throat> So it's a, a really good for your career to, to focus on open source tooling. And um, that's as, as a developer. But uh, companies also love it because they think that it's cheaper because they don't have to pay for it. Think that it's a, it's a lie, no? Because um, when is the either? OK, sorry, I, I just saw some. Uh, some, some comments there that I will uh, reply to them uh, later. Um, so yeah, the, company, the companies are going to think that it's much better because it's cheaper, but it's not true because you're going to be the one operating it. Uh, so this is something that you have to take uh, care of. You know, For example, for observ observability, there are companies like New Relic that are going to charge a lot to your company for giving you information about the systems that you are running, but it may, it may make sense. And um, even so, you cannot start saying, OK, because this is free and I have the time for, for it. <laughs> I have the time for it. I'm going to add so much uh, dependencies and open source um, projects as I can. Because uh, first of all, you have to decide which one to use. Uh, because they are open. Many people like create their own. And uh, this is uh, kind of um, bad because there, there are too many. Uh, 
then many of them, people don't commit to them enough. So they are not production ready. They are like, okay, I am doing this. Uh, um, uh, yeah, sorry. They say like, uh, I'm not going to, I don't have time for finishing this, this project. So, you know, you're screwed because you started having some expectations and they are never going to meet. And uh, even so, if they finish uh, the project, they may say like, this is just a proof of concept. Don't run this in production because if something bad happens, the company that is going to lose the money, it's yours and you cannot ask responsibility to, to anyone. Then uh, even so, there are some people that after university, they are like, okay, I, I really love uh, this and I want to, to continue. So for those ones that don't follow the professional uh, software development path right now, uh, they can do, uh, well, they will do a master for sure. Um, the master, it's, gonna, it's not going to have any difference from uh, what you did in the bachelor's. It's going to be like more in-depth content, but about the same, or some things that were in the age that they weren't able to, to explain it to you because of the lack of time. Um, but it's basically the same. You go there, professor explains you, you do some project and, and then it's over. Then if instead of that you go through the PhD, uh, even after the master, this is going to be like really different. So you may have liked a lot uh, university until that level and you may hate PhD uh, because here you are going to have to focus in depth in a topic to research on that topic and it's novel research. So it really changes this thing of, okay, a professor comes here and just explains me things because it's more about, okay, I have this problem. How do I solve it? And then you just start reading what other people uh, did on this um, problem, how they try to, to solve it. Then you start thinking out of the box and trying to connect things. And then eventually you have to provide a solution for something that does not exist yet or some open problems. In this case, the university and the advisors matters a lot. Uh, the advisor matters much, much more that it's going to be the person that it's going to be directing you. Um, because if he's an expert in the topic and he's a good advisor, you are going to be able to, you know, show a lot of potential. If not, you are a screw. And university is also important because of the name, but for nothing else. Uh, after that, you can do research in private companies. Uh, you can also, as myself, learn how to write salary. Sorry for the, well, in fact, how to write salary okay. Uh, sorry for the, the typos here. Uh, in this case, you can like skip uh, your master or PhD and do research at uh, companies. The salary is going to be okay, better than in public institutions, but many things that are called research today are not research they are just like okay i'm going to take this that already exists this that already exists and connect it uh, so if you really like university you may be disappointed on the kind of research that uh, some private companies are doing on the other hand if you go to top-notch companies like intel and what you like it's uh, research on the, on the chips you are going to enjoy a lot because you are going to basically be living in the future because they are going to show you the things that they are doing that they are not open yet. And if you go to public institutions, you are really like just rolling your dice there and you know you may end up having fun or not because uh, they are not result driven and uh, for that reason there is no natural selection improvement. There are people there who are just bad and uh, they can stay there forever. So, you know, if you end up having, you end up in a bad department, you can have like a really, a really bad time there. Now, even if you do academia or um, professional software development, um, you will have to spend a lot of time building stuff. And then this is something that you have to do at home too. Um, you have to build your own stuff and just play. You say, okay, I envision a software that does this and you just do it. And it's really good because you are going to learn about the tools that you use for it. You are going to learn about things that you do that are just wrong and you're going to see why and you're going to live why. So you're going to skip that mistake in the future. Another important thing is even if you want to envision a software that does X, you have to check what other people has already done. 
uh, and that not only means understand like I don't know the idea behind it, but actually check the implementations, and you can learn a lot from other people code. Uh, this is really good nowadays that there is GitHub because you can just go there and, and learn. If you can, after university, you should get a mentor as fast as possible or multiple mentors that are basically people who are experts in some area and lost a lot of time getting that knowledge. So, for example, uh, if I know a lot about uh, observability, you should ask me about observability because I can give you a wide vision of it and I can save you a lot of time. Why? Because I already saw things that didn't work. So it, it's, it's really good. And um, you can, if, well, if you can, you should go to talks, conference and meetups and hackathons like this one as much as you can because, you know, you can do this network for uh, knowing the, the mentors. And uh, also books are an incredible uh, source of, of um, knowledge that, you know, some people put a lot of effort on writing them and you can just uh, get that for free, free. Um, even the non-technical ones, I don't mean a novel about, I don't know, uh, vampires, but the ones that talk about how to, how some people organize, there is one called uh, Coders at Work, for example, um, that explains how some people that are professional coders and <laughs> really successful ones work every day, and you can learn a lot about their, their routines. So I was talking about this one, or clean code, or clean architecture, etc. So this is more or less what you are going to, to, to find after university. So this kind of uh, software companies or um, university uh, staff or research, how you can improve. And now uh, let's go to do the questions and answers. So if you have any doubts here, I can just uh, reply to, to them. I'm going to Twitch now. I'm going to read about it. So first of all, there is this hardened travel agency that says, why does my company use that SVN sheet instead of Git? Uh, well, SVN is it's, it's not, not a sheet. If they are using it, for sure it's because it's an old uh, development uh, code. It's, it's a code base that it's, it's not new. Uh, more than that, what you should... <laughs> do is be sure if the people who are using git that it's getting some uh, some good things of it like working with branches uh you know uh if you can do the same as uh, in your svn so more than the tool itself uh, focus on the what problem they are solving if they are using SVN in a way that, you know, it's making mad developers, it basically means that it's, it's just shit. So you should push for it to change if it's possible. And if you really hate it, just, you know, leave. Um, ah, where is the IDE? Sorry, this is not uh, an, an IDE. <laughs> like, I'm not going to program here. But uh, we can talk later and I can even, like, do another Twitch uh, writing code if you prefer. Um, no, do you have a mentor or mentee? Yeah, well, in my case, what I did was just after finishing university, what I liked the most was um, academia. Like the, I, I, I really like mathematics. So what I did was, meanwhile, I was at university. I went to some professors and I said, okay, I want to learn more about, for example, computational complexity or uh, numerical calculation, numerical methods. So they are pretty open to just spend time with you explaining new things. Uh, and after that, I went to IBM Research in, in California. And there I, I was able to work with uh, someone called uh, Ken Clarkson. Uh, it's not Superman. The, the name is it's, it's quite funny. Um, he's really famous in computational complexity because of um, computational um, geometry. So, yeah, I learned quite a lot of... Uh, of him and then what I did was for the technical part I don't have a, a mentor that is a physical person but what I do is I have some programming heroes in C++ in Golan and then I basically look at the stuff that they write and the conferences that, that, that they give and I learned quite quite a bit about it so how to create a good VC 
Uh, what is VC? It's like venture capital. It means like uh, version control. So if you can specify one second. Okay, Hamza, meanwhile you are uh, replying, I'm going to, to reply to the next one. What platform do you recommend to search for internships? I really think that uh, for a global thing, um, what you can do is, um, if what you want to work is at Google, Facebook, etc., they have like their own paths. Um, if not, uh, you can, for small companies, you can just write them and you can write them a letter on top of your resume that says, okay, I know this company, I want to work here because you do this, this and this, and uh, I really think that I can't uh, bring value here because, you know, it's aligned with uh, what I want to do in life. And they basically are going to, to hire you if they are hiring. Um, but if not, uh, LinkedIn, it's like the, the biggest one um, where people get uh, most of the offers. It's, it's a problem because uh, after some years, this is something that happens to me. Like you don't look for um, jobs anymore or almost never. You basically talk with people. You, I don't know, have a friend in Vancouver that says, okay, Jordi, do you want to work for Amazon Vancouver here on the Amazon Web Service part? And then I have another one that works, I don't know, at Google Zurich. And then they ask you to, to, to go, you know, if, if you want them to, to recommend you. Uh, I do the same from my companies. So this is a problem that it's just at starting, and after that, if uh, you get a good network, you will be able to do much, much better. Do you recommend to change companies every couple of years to increase your salary? If you are very comfortable at your... Even if you are really comfortable? Okay. So, first of all, uh, it's really hard to assess how good an offer is. Because it depends on the team, it depends on the company, it depends on your um, circumstances at that moment, you know, a good offer in with 20 years, it's not the same as with 40, you know, if you may want more time or less time in different phases of, of your life. So there is something that for sure you can evaluate in an objective way that it's a salary. So something that I wouldn't do that much, it's accept an offer that it's too low for what I need for a living. If you do that, you're going to be screwed because after four months, you're going to burn out because you're going to say like, okay, I'm enjoying, but I need more money. So you're going to create tension there. So you're going to ask for more money. Could happen that the company gives it to you because they are really happy about your performance or could also happen that the company gives you your salary, not because of who you are or what you, the value that you bring, but because they want to fit that position, okay? They are looking for a junior developer. So you join that company you show that you are a really good developer and you bring a lot of value, you ask for more salary and they say like, sorry, we are not going to give you more, more money because you know, it's, it's, it's too soon yet. So something that what many people do is say, okay, if the problem is that they hire me for this position and I cannot increase my salary because I am not Jordi Montes anymore. I am, you know, a developer filling this position. I'm going to change. Uh, companies usually do not change uh, employees from one position to another and pay more, so they change the company. At the beginning, that make, may make sense uh, as long as you are not changing only for the money. If you are changing only for the money but you are going to stop learning, um, you should to really take care of that trade-off because you are going to be stuck in a while. Uh, so for that reason, I also said that you should work in the last technologies as a new grad because you are going to be able to, you know, target for, for more money. If you are really happy of your company, if you earn enough for living and to be happy, don't change the company. Even if they pay you more in, an, in another place, I, I, would, I would keep it the same position. Okay, I guess that he wanted to ask about CVs. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, for CVs, uh, what I can do is, uh, I, well, what I would do is go to Share Latex or Overleaf, it's called now, get some, oh, wait, wait, the, the best way to, to do a CV is to actually put things for the company that you are applying to. 
What's the problem? That does not scale. You can do that for three companies that you really want to work for, but not anymore. So what you could do is uh, one of your mentors or those uh, programming heroes that, that, that you follow, usually they have their website and they have their, their, their CV. So you can copy the, the format. And if not, uh, I can uh, share with you my mind from um, LaTeX that it's, uh, I can put it on GitHub and you can copy it from, from there. Sorry. It's really important to, in the, in the CV, put things that you bring on the table, not only the technologies. So you not only say, okay, I migrated this application from Python to C. No, you say, I migrated this application from Python to C, getting more than 50% of um, speed up and this kind, and um, lower footprint, memory footprint. So th this kind of uh, sentences help a lot because they get the attention of the, the people who are hiring. And the last one says, I'm still second year fee, but I wanted to know if you graduated fully prepared for work. Okay. Um, this is a problem that many people face that it's, uh, they finish university and they say like, okay, I feel like I'm not prepared for, for work. Do not worry. You are not. That's okay. <laughs> Universities do not prepare you for doing your work. They prepare you to be able to do your work. So that means that you are not going to uh, start working perfectly since moment one, but you are going to have the base for uh, learning everything at really good speed. If you want to be prepared for working, the only way is to or work for a company, have a mentor that teaches you what to do, or uh, join some um, open source projects and uh, help there. There is a problem. How open source is developed, it's not the same as how companies internally develop stuff. Why? Because usually with open source, you are developing code, a library, but you are not operating that library. So you don't have to deploy, you don't have... So yeah, you are going to learn how to do pull requests and how to communicate and what things are important, but you are going to miss uh, a part. But you shouldn't care that much about it because as long as you know like you showed that you learned some technologies and you have some side project, you are going to be hired even if you are not prepared for the job. So th that's a good thing. Like, you know, they hire you because you're not prepared, but because you have the potential. And it's really good because then we have in the world yet another developer that has good knowledge to teach more people. So we are able to tackle um, harder, harder problems. Okay, so I tried to uh, reply in the in Twitch, but I have the problem that um, I'm not a user, so I, I couldn't couldn't reply. If uh, there are no more questions, uh, we can stop it here. I can share my email, for example, or my GitHub account, and uh, if you have any doubt, just uh, I have one more. Okay, if you have uh, more doubts, you can just uh, actually reply to me. So I had Hamza, the last question. No, 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 no. LinkedIn, um, there are many small companies that don't care about LinkedIn that much. LinkedIn is a tool for recruiters. So Recruiters are going to get you from there, but recruiters are not going to hire you, okay? They are going to say uh, to the CTO or to some uh, technical recruiter, uh, sorry, to some uh, software developer, okay, look at this guy. I think that it's a potential good fit for, for us, but they are for sure not going to share your LinkedIn. They are going to, um, to give a, a paper to that person. So... Uh, the CV, it, it's, it's really important and it doesn't have that much um, noise on, on it because when people are uh, looking at uh, any page, for example, LinkedIn, first of all, they have more tabs open, they have more, uh, like, I don't know, Slack, it's uh, um, 
notifying that you have uh, someone that wants to talk to you. So it's harder for the person to focus. Actually, if they have a paper, they focus on the paper and they're still looking to the, to the screen that it, it's really good. Um, that's for getting a job. For getting an internship, many times, maybe it's just applying and then following some steps. So LinkedIn, it's, it's good enough. So I think that this is all. Is it difficult to get a job in another country? It depends. For example, when I finish university here in Barcelona, uh, my parents are born here, me too, so I am a citizen of uh, European Union. Back then, uh, England still being part of the European Union. So I applied to multiple companies, some of them in the West Coast, in, uh, in California, some of them in the UK, and some of them here in Barcelona. There was no difference between the ones in Barcelona and the ones in UK, so they can just hire you and you move there and start working. However, if you want to go to, uh, to work to countries that, where you need a visa, that's much, much harder. For small startups, sometimes they just like refuse you, and even big ones, it's kind of a hassle. So you have to bring a lot of value if you want them to, to give you a visa. On the other hand, there are companies that they say, I don't know, um, IBM, I'm going to have a, a number of visas. So if you're able to get one of those, it's okay. But, um, you know, moving in Europe, easy. Moving to uh, USA, quite hard. Unless you marry someone from there. Ah, by the way, for this is the only thing that degrees matter. So when you are moving to another country that is outside, uh, outside of European Union, you have to get a visa and the things that give you point are formal studies. So for example, if you want to move to Canada, if you have a PhD, it's easier than if you are the best developer that doesn't have a degree. That's really bad, but it's how the world keeps uh, working. So when are things related with um, states, formal education still matters. Okay, so I think that uh, this is all. Uh, let me share with the organizers my like, um, GitHub profile so you can like talk to me and I'm more than happy to, to spend time with you like, solving more and more questions. Um, I gave this talk because uh, some organizers of Hack UPC last time told me that this kind of talk would be a, a good one for many people that don't know what to do after university. But uh, I am more a mathematician or a computer scientist, a theoretical computer scientist, and uh, like really a hacker, someone who hacks a lot of code. So if you want to talk about those things, I am also a, a, good, uh, a good person for that. So, you know, you don't only have to come to me with problems like, okay, uh, does this CV look good enough? But, okay, I want to deploy this or I have this project in mind. What kind of technologies should I, should I do? What should I use? Okay, so perfect. Uh, I'm going to stop. It was nice to have you there and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Bye.